You're the Brooklyn guys. One of the wise guys happened to be on the tour that we were on, the Bigger and Deffer tour. Houdini was um, the co-headliner of the group, and one of the dancers was um, one of the cats. And uh, the wise guys, his name is Stretch, Emilio Austin. So he and Muff were together on the tour with the, with uh, Houdini, and Muff would always come back. And whenever we would go home, you know we get caught up, he'd be like, man, we, I got this group, dude, these dudes out of Brooklyn, they dope, they call the wise guys, they're stretching, and his boys and stuff, so I was like, okay, you know, Muff, if you, if you believe, you got my blessings, okay? So we finally meet him, and it's Stretch, and it's Big Ill, the Mac, it's Tron, I think the DJ's name was Steven, Stevie, or Steven, and it, and it was a couple of other guys, but I don't remember their names, but that was the, um, that was the uh, uh, platform of that group. And they were dope. I mean, they were New York dudes. So again, being from New York is like being from Philly. If you're in Philly and you can't ball, you gotta move, you can't be in Philly, dude. So if you're in New York and you can't rhyme, you know what I'm saying, what are you doing here? And, and I'm serious about that. It was, it, everyone could rap, you know what I'm saying? But it was just, there because everyone could rap, that made it easy to find out who was really dope and who wasn't. You, you know what I'm saying? You know, the neighborhood that we lived in in Brooklyn is not too far from where uh, Jay-Z was. You know what I'm saying? Biggie was around the corner. You, you feel me? Um, Dana Dane was down the street. I mean, it was just so, so much talent. And we lived in a, in, in a place called Fort Greene. You know what I'm saying? So, it was talent every freaking where, you know, MC Search. MC Search was, 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 was at the Latin quarters, whopping in front of everybody, you know, the only white boy out there, you know what I'm saying? But Search knew he could hold his own, you know what I mean? So, I'm telling you, man, when we did, when I'm Bad came out, we, we didn't really know the magnitude of what we had done. We went to the Latin quarters one time, and when I tell you the old school pioneers were there, I'm talking about to where you bow down. It was Cool Herc, Grandmaster Kaz, Melly Mel, Scorpio, you know what I'm saying? Bernard Wright, you probably don't know who Bernard Wright is. I know you know who Bernard Wright, I'm hobble, gobble tripping, chilling out, you know what I'm saying? And it's us, these wide eyes kids, looking at them like, wow. And they were like, no, do you know what y'all did? He's like, no. He said, you fucking took Courageous Cat and made I'm Bad. And I'm Bad, Courageous Cat was a cartoon back in the 60s. You know, he was like uh, Mighty Mouse. You know what I'm saying? It was a Bobcat idea. He was, do, 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 He's like, and you guys rhymed over cartoon music and won? Get out of here. We're looking at you guys in amazement. And at that point, we were on. We were accepted. We never had beef with New York. We were never ran out of town. There were times we would go places and people didn't like LL, but that was just that New York jealousy, borough, we from Brooklyn, you from Queens type stuff, and, and Todd was serving them, and, and, and you know, they didn't like it. So, you know, we had some, we had some episodes and, some nights it wasn't good when we went to the club. He just bought his, bought his brand new red Audi 5000 and me and him and Bobcat go to, um, it wasn't Latin Quarters, it was, I uh, can't remember the name of it, Muffin Breeze or no. But we're there and when we're inside, you know, it's getting kind of hectic. So we decide we're going to leave and when we get outside, it's about two or three hundred dudes from Brooklyn beefing, just, just didn't like us. We get in the car and all of a sudden I start seeing glass breaking and I look up and 40 ounce bottles are hitting the car and it broke the windshield and LL and Bob want to get out and try to fight 200 people. I'm in the back seat, you know, hold them like we'll die tonight, dudes. We can't beat up all these guys, you know what I'm saying? And if you beat up one, you're going to get jumped. Drive the car off, Todd. Let's go home. Live to fight another day. It's crazy, man. 
Okay, here it goes. Breeze was probably the most successful in terms of record sales. Breeze would also leave and come home to Cali where he was affiliated and associated with all the guys in, in California, you know, Pooh, Bob, Ice-T, you know, and he's getting information and, and things from them about how his deal should be, what he should be making, and so on and so forth. Now you got to think about it, if Breeze signed to a production deal, that means that there's basically 12 points in the deal. So the company going to keep six points, they're going to give six points to the artist. But when they're telling him, you know, especially a person like Ice-T, you do a deal like me, you can get six dollars a record. And then Capitol Records comes in and does some contractual interference and start talking to Breeze, filling his head with a bunch of crap. Sylvia Rome calls me and says, you know what? No, I actually call Sylvia, and I'm like, did we do well enough to do another album? She said, you know what? We do another Breeze record, you know, fully budgeted, we'll, we'll up the budget and blah, blah, blah. We're like, cool. Call Breeze and I tell him, he's like, I don't want to be on that label. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, dude. And he actually called her and told her that. I get a phone call from Sylvia. I said, hello, Daryl, what the fuck is wrong with him? I said, I don't know. What happened? She said, he's telling me he don't want to be on my label. He's like, no, he didn't. She said, he ain't no DOC. She says, you watch and see how many white people do for you that I've done for y'all. I was like, we don't know. That's not what we want. But what it showed her is we had no control of our artists. You know what I'm saying? And things like that. And, 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 and um, it, it was just bad. We were young, man. You know what I'm saying? We meant well. We didn't have any, any, any guidance around us. The Wise Guys album was a flop. They caused so much drama and trouble at the label that they were never going to get a second chance. Okay? They were not going to get a second chance. And then our album came out and we thought we had enough momentum. And at the end of the day, the only, day, the only way the deal could be done again is if it was done in its entirety, a four album deal, things like that. I mean, we were willing to negotiate and bring it down and so on and so forth. But I think Sylvia had ran her course with kids who didn't understand what they were doing. She still loves us, you know. I, I can still call Sylvia and she'll talk to me. She doesn't humor me. He said, yeah, send me what you got. And I thought I sent her some things sometimes that was phenomenal, and Muff will attest to that, but it just didn't move her. So that was that. After the Atlantic deal, you know, people's spirits were broken. You know, we didn't want to try to go back in and record and go to another label. There was a lot of um, tension and beef amongst certain people. It was never, never with me and Dwayne. You know what I mean? It was just certain things that he was doing that I didn't agree with. Maybe some things that I was doing that he didn't agree with. But music never broke us up in terms of being friends. You, know, you, you see a lot of guys now who generally hate each other. You know what I'm saying? Our old business manager, we talked to her a month ago. She was like, you guys are still talking? We was like, this was before music. Music didn't put this together and music ain't gonna break it up. You know what I'm saying? Funny you would ask, we are currently trying to record something now for a, a Will Ferrell movie that's, that's scheduled to come out maybe next year or the year after or whatnot, but we can't see, seem to get to second base. You know, Dwayne been telling me for a couple weeks, I'm gonna send you the tracks, okay? I'm, every morning I get up, no tracks. Muff, where the tracks? Oh, I got so much on my plate. You know, but I love the idea that you gave me. Just lyrically, we could do that. Okay, well, what are we doing? It's just been so long. You've been see. He stopped doing it longer than than I did. When I when um when L.A. Posse stopped doing what they were doing, I went into the business to work. You know what I mean? I went in to become an A and R person. I was the um I went to uh, Epic Records. Come sit down. I went to Epic Records and um, became an intern. And I did that because I wanted to see what made the, the business move, who pushed the buttons, who said yes and no to, to what we thought was good and someone said no. And, and during that time, you know, I met people and 
word came up. Actually, the president of uh, <laughs> the president of Epic Records at the time was the same guy that gave us a production deal. His name was Richard Griffiths. So he knew me. He knew what I was capable of doing. So technically, by law, I wasn't an employee there, so I wasn't supposed to be on the grounds. But he was like, you stay here every day. You can sit in my office when I'm in New York and do what you need to do. I'm like, OK, cool. A job became available. And it was with this man named John Singleton. You guys probably don't know who that is either. But he did movies like Boys in the Hood and, you know what I'm saying? Just anyway. He had a, um, he had a, a deal with Epic Records. Thank you.